Um, welcome to uh, the first session after lunch, and thank you for coming along to compliance session as the first one after lunch. Excellent choice. Um, well done, everyone. Um, I'm Matt Brewer. I got the easy job. I'm just the, the chair for this session. Actually, I'll, I'll stand away from the pillar. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and uh, what we're going to be talking about is as you might have guessed, compliance. Now, you've probably seen downstairs, there's lots of great tools and ideas and other things to do with online learning. So why does compliance still get such a bad rep? So that's why um, we have, from AstraZeneca, we have Louise Van Vukaiki, and from uh, Virgin Money, we have Sean Brown, who are going to take you through their ideas and what they've done within their companies because, and this is a really left field reference I'm going to make here, anyone remember a, an 80s band called the Blow Monkeys? just to show your age. Excellent. In the words of one of their songs, it doesn't have to be this way. Okay, tenuous link number one. Um, so what we're gonna talk about is compliance and the fact that it doesn't have to be the way it's done now. Okay, um, so I now get the easy job of handing over. What I would like to, th um, to say as well, we'll have questions halfway through and at the end. Um, but also, Don mentioned in the keynote this morning about this idea of the bridge, about you creating a bridge between what you hear here and then what you go back and commit to doing when you're back at work. So I will ask you at the end of the session about some ideas and ways that you could actually take something from this session, take it back to work and commit to doing it, because that's often the thing that we forget to do. Okay, so we'll come back to that at the end. But I will now hand you over to Louise. Hello, good afternoon everyone. Hello. So as you can see, I'm Louise, I work for AstraZeneca, a global pharmaceutical company. Um, I have the privilege to work within a function called global sustainability, which global compliance sits in with our organization, which is quite radical, quite forward thinking, but you know, makes my working life an absolute, absolute pleasure. And I head up education and engagement. So I'm responsible for that sort of compliance training that comes from the global hub. Um, I wanted to take you through a bit of a journey that we've been on about how we change the face of compliance training within our organization, and particularly one course. Now, this is one of only two mandatory courses that goes to everybody within my company. It's a global company across the world. So how we can change perception, how we can create engagement within compliance training. But Firstly, my clicker's not working. <laughs> but firstly, I wanted to really talk to you about compliance training generally. The keynote speaker this morning kind of hit a note with me when she was talking about candor and, and being honest. So I wanted to really understand from, from people in this room, you know, I don't know, out of interest, how many of you are di directly responsible for any compliance training? Lots of you. And if you imagine the scenario, you've got some new compliance training to launch. Yay. Uh, and you're walking down the corridor, and an employee within your organization, you don't know them, walks past you. And if you say to them, we've got some compliance training coming up, what's their response at the moment? With candor. Anyone? <laughs> right. It's not curiosity, generally. It's, it's, it's often not enthusiasm. Let's be perfectly honest. It's not excitement. It's not any of those amazing qualities that we know, as learning professionals, make learning stick. All those positive feelings that people have when they start to take a course that makes it really resonate with them. And for me personally, that's not good enough, right? Why not? Why can't compliance training be like that? So this is my story. And as with any good story, we start with some challenges, right? Um, working at AstraZeneca, we work in global pharmaceuticals. So heavily regulated industry. I don't know how many of you have that same situation where it's Compliance training has to be this way. We are heavily regulated, right? And it's important for us, you know, if we don't do things right within our, our industry, there are consequences. And in pharmaceuticals, you know, this can run into fines that go into the billions of dollars. But more importantly, 
We all come to work because we believe in our patients. We believe that as a company, that we can change people's lives for the better. We can even save lives. And if we don't do things the right way, we put that in jeopardy and nobody wants that. So as I talk through this, as I talk through the differences we made within compliance training, I don't want you to think that I've forgotten the rules. They're really important. The regulation that we do is our license to operate, really important, but a challenge nevertheless. The second thing, this one course goes to over 70,000 employees or third parties that work on our behalf. And that's around the globe. That's literally every time zone covered here. And we think about language differences, but cultural differences, massive cultural differences within these populations. One course, how do we do that? How do we get resonance with the biggest possible audience? And of course, everybody's doing the training, right? You could be in operations, you could be in a lab, you could be a sales rep about to go and see a doctor in legal, in HR, in IT. There's a wide range of roles there. So how do we make one piece of training engaging to everybody? It doesn't matter what you do, from you know, the cleaner to the CEO, everybody takes this. And finally, for me, my own personal passion and the biggest challenge of all, because I like to set myself a big challenge, is to move from this, I have to do my compliance training, to I want to do my <laughs> compliance training. As I say, I like to set myself big challenges. But what we did was we incorporated quite a few measures to try and see if we could get that change and that shift change this year with our training. And what I wanted to do is explore each of those solutions for you. Now, hopefully, for some of you, this might help validate what you're doing at the moment or what you're trying to do. For others, it might give you ideas. There may be one or two things that you want to pick up. For others, it might give you ammunition. It might give you the courage to say, as an L&D professional, listen, this is, this is where we need to go, and this is where we need to move to. So the first part of the solution is a change of one word. Now, I was going to say this was a bit of a, a gift to us, and in some ways it was, but actually, our function was influential in getting this change through. We moved from a code of conduct to a code of ethics. One word, same thing, massive difference. For me, conduct is something that is done to you. We have a company code of conduct. These are the rules that we are laying down and this is how we expect you to behave. And I think compliance training for years now has gone down that path, right? And we've all seen it. So we talk about, you know, we talk about policies in great depth and procedures, no matter what your role is. I think compliance training for years as well has had some very negative connotations. We do talk about those consequences of doing harm. Quite often, it feels like we write compliance training for the people we expect to do bad things and not the vast, vast, vast majority of our employee population who are there to do good. And as a result, I think it, it creates strange emotions. I think people can be quite confused when they take their compliance training. Um, for me, personally, I find that sort of thing very demotivational. I kind of take it personally a little bit when they sort of say, you can go to jail. I'm like, what do they think I'm doing? Is this about me? Um, and it can frighten people, right? And we go back to what makes good engagement within our training. Curiosity, excitement, enthusiasm, energy. It, it's not there. The move to ethics for us was fundamental. Um, one word, but a big difference. Because... Again, the rules are important. I will not forget to stress this. But when we talk ethics, it's something we all have. I mean, I'd appreciate a show of hands of anyone who doesn't believe they're in any way ethical. Um, <laughs> ethics are different from person to person. But it goes from the organization is telling you this is the way to behave to these are our ethics. How do our ethics align? How do our values align with yours? 
and all of a sudden it becomes different. Yes, we have our rules, but we can talk about the principles. We can talk about those overarching principles that go over those rules that allow people to use their own good judgment to make decisions. Because I don't know for any of your industries whether you're seeing less rules these days. I know we're surely not. <laughs> and there's never a rule for every occasion. So we can change the tone. And we linked our training with our company values and particularly our behaviours. So we could change the context when we talk about compliance risks. So this year, we talked about inclusion and diversity, something we passionately believe in at AstraZeneca. But when you've talked about that concept for just a little while, when you start to talk about speaking up and the importance of reporting any breaches, it has a different context. It has a different tone people are brought in. Accountability was another one talking about personal accountability, team accountability, teaching people to hold their managers, hold their colleagues to account. Then when we move into talking about bribery and corruption, more context. Finally, we talked about resilience, you know, the ability to bounce back, the ability to protect yourself for the future. And when you do that, and then you have to talk about data privacy, or cyber security and building those resilient infrastructures that keeps your company safe. Again, resonance. So this is just one word change, but it means that the conversation that we can have has been completely is completely different now. The second part, um, one of my personal bugbears, legal ease. I don't know how many of you have taken this compliance course yourself where there's so much legal jargon you're confused. I mean, you know, um, I'm a reasonably intelligent woman, but I have scratched my head on many a piece of compliance training that I've had to take. Let's talk the language of the business, right? And by that, what do I mean? Well, we're not trying to make the business compliance professionals. And I think that's a mistake that, that companies that courses have made over the years, right? That we think if we impart all our professional compliance wisdom on them somehow they'll soak it like a sponge and they're all compliance out in the business it's not realistic we just need to teach people how to do their job right end of also think about your role within l d when it comes to subject matter experts right because they're a valuable part of our business they know their area better than anyone else in the world but they want to talk about it all. They want to you to create a course or a piece that covers the A to Z of everything, right? And we all know that if we give somebody 30 things to think about, it's pretty random as to what they're going to walk away with. So again, we're changing the conversation. And we'll now go to our subject matter experts and we will say to them, what are the two things that people aren't getting right? What are the two things that they're really struggling with? Let's distill down, let's focus on those things so that we know that when they go away, we've done a really good job at solving your problems rather than training them on everything. And finally, if I go back to the global issue, the cultures, the different roles within the organization, something that we tried that was massively successful this year was we set up a focus group. So we've got a global compliance function out there in the business. But we got a cross representation of all the business units, all the regions within the business. And when we were going through that process of scenario writing, script writing, every two weeks we all met. And we didn't stop until every part of that group, every country in the world, kind of understood what we were talking about. And we got that affirmation so that we could increase the engagement with this one course. So tone's really important to me. I think, it, I think it massively changes employee engagement, but it's, it's not the whole story. We have a great in-house team. Two of my team are sitting in the front row. Hello. <laughs> and they produce amazing materials, but Code of Ethics is a beast. So this is done in English in 10 languages. We think we've got a good geographical spread at that, and we don't have time to do it. It would take us most of the year. So we use an outsource vendor to complete this bit of training. Um, and I don't know about you, but we have different relationships with vendors, but a little bit like when I was saying about the subject matter experts, they expect us to be order takers. And I think in the past we were 
order takers. They would give us the A to Z, we would churn something out. I wanted this from a vendor. I wanted to move from an order taker to a true partner. And it took a while, I won't lie. I literally got my learning technologies brochure open, looked at about 20 websites. I think I must have had phone conversations with about 10 organizations. And then asked three of them to pitch to me. And the first thing I said was, this isn't your ordinary piece of compliance training. I want something different because I wanted to find a partner that was willing to understand where we were coming from, willing to change. Um, I have to say two out of the three then showed us compliance training that they'd done for other people. <laughs> but we found a shining light in that. And that's a company called Sponge who are downstairs, if any of you want to meet them. But, but they kind of got us straight away. And, and what do I mean by a true partner? Well, for me, the most important thing is someone that will challenge me. Okay, someone that will take last year's course and have a really objective look through it and say, listen, I didn't understand that bit at all. That didn't resonate with me. And actually, we'll go further than that. So we provided all the feedback that we'd had from the previous year's course and they looked at it and they went, well, that's great. But actually, we want to speak to your learners when you're not around. So they actually made, they had telephone interviews with a huge variety of our learners to find out really what our learners thought, what they remembered from the course, what was missing, and got a really good picture and then presented that back to us. So those challenges have been fundamental in helping us improve the quality of training that we've got. We needed someone innovative. So this is learning technologies. We've kind of talked a lot about learning, but here's where the technology comes in. When I think about all the different roles within our, our organization, and we've known this for a little while now, they all need to take their learning differently. And actually what we need to do as an organization is facilitate them to be able to take that learning when they want to, how they want to. And innovation is good. So we, we started with mobile first because we'd realized that all our sales reps are on iPads. Quite a lot of our executives are at the airport missing a flight and might want to do it on an iPhone. But it kind of degraded the experience that the laptop users were having. So we needed an innovative solution. Now, I don't know if any of you have come across Adapt. It's a great platform. Mobile responsive. Whatever device you're on, it will fit the screen beautifully. So you don't get that degradation. But more importantly, it has some great learnings behind it. It goes up and down like a website, right? Not click next, which I will admit freaks some people out but we persevere. Um, it allows people to learn at the speed they want to learn. Um, you know, if any of you are speed readers and you've been stifled in a course to wait until a voiceover finishes or wait until a time lapse before you can click next, it becomes frustrating if that happens a lot. So this enabled, they still had to answer all the questions, they still had to watch all the videos, but they could do it at their pace. And I think one of the fundamental things for me was at the end of this course, the course is open. It's fully open. There's a menu. You can go straight to what you want to again. So we were hoping people would use this more of a resource. We know that people, the instances of people going back to courses in LMSs once they're done is pitifully low. So can we, can we change that? So innovation, again, really big part in what we did. And I think finally, <sighs> It was just that feeling of someone that not only understands us, but understands learners. And they would be able, they were able to provide some great new concepts for us. You know, we had 20 second videos to introduce each module that had no sound, but perfectly illustrated what we were trying to say in terms of a value or behavior. Um, and it's those little nuances, those tweaks that, that made a great sort of partnership for us. But this was probably the big thing for me. This was something that our, par our partner taught us. Um, you know, this is a one-off course, a one mandatory course once a year. And we so often say, you know, code of ethics isn't a once a year thing. It's something that you should do all the time. So we took the decision to move from course to campaign. Still one mandatory course in the center. The only mandatory thing but let's start to generate some interest here. 
So a few weeks before the course launched, rather than the static you know, website news articles, the code's coming, boop, we decided to use social media. We have a workplace, so Facebook for business system. And we decided to really get into people's heads. We had a trailer. We had a little, like a movie trailer about what the course was about, teasing what the sort of things that they were going to be learning. Had about, well, well over 2,000 hits, which is pretty good for that sort of media. We also provided some great templates that our colleagues in the business could use and edit. So we had great messages going out in Japanese, Chinese, Russian, Turkish. And we really got that conversation going before we launched the course. And then, of course, after the course, there's people that are still curious, right? Not everyone. Some people do want to go into the course, do it, get out again. That's absolutely fine. But what about the people that want to understand a little bit more? And this is where we started to continue the conversation. So we launched at the end of September, when that mandatory period of taking the training was over. We started to introduce bite-sized materials, short animation here, a nice PDF that line managers can use there, something to encourage conversation using social media platforms. None of them mandatory, but it allows that learner population and the people that want to continue that conversation to carry it on which is really important. You know, we've just had a, a short animation that's got something like four and a half thousand hits more now on our social media site. Those levels are reserved for when the CEO is talking normally for AstraZeneca. So people are interested and people are watching. Um, but hopefully if this works now, just let me give you a little bit of a flavor for those of you that haven't seen Adapt as to what this looked like. Stall. But everyone on there was an AstraZeneca employee, everyone that we used. So in those empathy videos, we found some great people that would want to shoot um, that information for us. When we go to leaders, we didn't go with the CEO or the higher level set leaders. We went for those people in the business that have charisma. And the way I like to describe it to people is, if you go on a Skype meeting or something like that and you see a list of 20 names, if there's a name there that stands out and you go, this is going to be a good one, those are the people that we went with. Did you ask them to record by their own or did you use like the video thing to do that? I mean, like using the smartphone because they are kind of like informal, you know, without any logo and so on, the background or was it like more formalized? This year we did it more formalized. The year before we did it on iPhones and we found that maybe the sound quality wasn't as we would like it. So we did, we did use a film crew in our Cambridge office um, that came with the, 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 the training organization as well, um, just so it was clear. Um, but we tried to keep it very relaxed, and that's the importance of a, a good film crew, right? They will, they will relax it right down. We didn't script anything. And it's just like in terms of credibility, you know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I, I, agree, I agree entirely. Yeah, no, it, it's a good point. So that sort of credibility is important and the charisma. I think the one thing that we had found with production quality when we'd done it the year before was that in parts it was hard to hear. So with video, if you can't hear, it doesn't matter what it looks like. So we kind of went with this approach. But I agree with you entirely. And in fact, next year, we're looking at moving the story on. And we are going to have to ask people around the world to submit their videos. So it's going to be an interesting time. But yeah, don't, ta don't take my word for it. Let let's have a look at some of the results. 14% increase in our 30-day completion rates. The buzz that we generated before. The curiosity means people take it quicker. And you know, this is really important for us because my team, yes, we get to design the wonderful training, but also we have to reconcile it. We have to make sure that everybody's completed it, chase everybody that hasn't. So. It is 30 days. 
We don't have consequences, no. Yeah. No, no. It, it's a debate that the compliance department have often, but there are no consequences. It just, you know, it just makes my team's job harder when we're chasing people for completion, right? But I guess in terms of compliance, right, a lot of managers are having to, like, properly eye on the evaluation and the improvement team make sure that the improvements are Yeah. Yeah. And our, on our LMS, we'll send out notification reminders to the learner and then to a certain point to the line manager as well. So you're right, line manager responsibility is really important. Um, we launched on a Sunday because, because the LMS is a bit quiet there. Um, but we, I, I sit there on a Sunday paranoid that this course might not work with the 11 different languages. And I'm seeing completion rates go up. And I think, well, I'll, I'll keep watching this until every language is done and I've got some security. But I thought initially this would be the Middle East on the Sunday, because they work on a Sunday. But actually, again, it was everywhere around the world. It was amazing. So our first day, non-working day completions were really high. Um, and something that we've tried before, and again, I don't know whether I can completely put this down to the changes that we've made. Normally, when people complete our course, there's an email sent automatically from the LMS, you know, congratulations, you've done your code of ethics. And traditionally, what we've done is we've got one line within that congratulations that says, and if you want to leave some feedback on the course, click here. Um, now, in the past, click here has just opened up a, an email that people can write their feedback and send. And we've had about 70 pieces of feedback, which always felt a little bit low. This year, we, we used a survey monkey. We didn't allude to it. It was the same line. We had over 2,200 pieces of volunteered feedback from that channel alone this year. And what it's done is it's been able to, to vindicate the changes that we're making through the statistics that we've been able to get. 86% said their understanding of the values and behaviors, essentially our code of ethics, has increased or greatly increased. This is a really important one for me. 89% thought the learning was extremely useful or very useful to their job role. So this is where I talked about the focus group, right? When you get to that stage where you're building that training, get input. Make sure that this is resonating with everyone because I think we've got some proof that it, it, it did. Engagement levels. I will take that every day of the week with a piece of compliance training. And it was better than last year's for 81% of people. Again, I'll take that every day. But we saw a bit of an explosion in social media as well, in the workplace system, that was great. So we were actually able to take other pieces of feedback from that. Um, and I'm going back to my original challenge. I have to take my compliance training moving to I want to take my compliance training. I wouldn't mind doing it once a month. Seriously, it's compliance training. I love that individual. <laughs> I wish I knew who they were, but you know, fantastic. And, and my favorite piece of feedback of all actually came from one of our country presidents. Um, and one of my colleagues works in Warsaw, so I was able to see this. He sent an email out after he completed his code training to everybody within that market. Um, it was a long email. He went through every module, what it meant to him. It was unsolicited. It didn't look that way, in fact. <laughs> so it looked like I'd prompted, but hadn't. Um, but this is a senior leader, unprompted, reaching out to people, talking about inspiration from compliance training, changing that tone, and showing us that actually, with compliance training, we can empower people to really use their good judgment. So that's my story. I won't pretend that. We're completely there yet in the shift. It wasn't just, you know, we did it for one year and everybody was there. But those responses are far better than any of our expectations, I think. Do we have any, uh, any questions uh, for Louise before we move on? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll bring this down. <laughs> this is where I get fit. <laughs> we'll make it easy. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
thank you for your talk. It was excellent. Um, I, I, I saw some of your statistics up there, and that's, it's impressive. I was wondering if you have done any research to see kind of improvements in terms of actual compliance incidents, like have you had a, a decrease in, in terms of issues or things like that related to the trainings? Or? That's, that's a really hard one, isn't it? I know, I don't... Because there's so many other things going on through the business, right. and I know this is a challenge that Sponge, our learning provider, constantly gives me, and it's hard to say. So we have, you know, AstraZeneca, like most large organizations, we have, for example, an anonymous hotline, an anonymous website where people can report compliance issues. But I can't say hand on heart whether that course was responsible for any increase or whether some sort of company reorganization was or some sort of systems change was. So it's really hard for me to, to, to work out the exact consequences. And, and we are talking with our investigations team that, that are responsible to that, for that system to try and see if there's any way that we can bring that in. But it's a tough measurement. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought you'd say. Yeah. <laughs> it is tough, yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions for Louis? Oh, we have, all right. I'll, I'll come this way. Hi, yeah, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, how do you assess uh, the learners at the end? Or is it just completion? Do you have questions that you ask the learner after it's completing? Just, it's just completion. Right. Um, again, being a global organization, we have to be a little bit careful in terms of, of our assessments sometimes. So, for example, the German Works Council, some other sort of French unions and how you score people and how you test people can be quite difficult. But it is about using good judgment. Um, and the scenarios that we pick are purposefully grey. Because I don't know about you, but again, I hate... I hate tra any sort of training where the answer's obvious. I, I have this, this thing myself where if, if one of the options in a question is all of the above, I'll press it because I know it is, otherwise it wouldn't be there. Most of the time I'm right. So we wanted, we wanted to challenge people's behaviours more than necessarily test in that respect. We had one question, a sort of health and safety based question, where there was a, there was a puddle of something on the floor and what, what do you do? And, and one of the answers was clean it up. The other one was report it, and we said that report it was the right one. And I had somebody, I had an annoy, annoyed person on the email going, this is ridiculous, I clean up tea, coffee, spillages all the time. And I had to write back and say, we didn't say what was spilled. Could have been a chemical, right? You'd have cleaned it up. So compliance is all about the grey. The black and white is fairly straightforward and fairly easy to learn, but it's those areas, those areas where maybe there's no rules yet that we wanted to really challenge people to, to start using those principles, those values, those behaviours, their knowledge of risk, to think about how they would navigate through that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll, I'll go to that lady first and then I'll come back to you. Two really quick questions. What was the, what was the duration of the e-learning insofar as you can track it, calculate it? And the second question, how long did the project take start to finish? 30 minutes. And I had to fight for that. And I had to provide lots of evidence as to why it should be 30 minutes. We're trying to 20. I feel your pain. Yeah, absolutely. In, in fairness, I start, I start thinking about it around now. Um, because we've got quite a unique tone, um, I write it with a colleague. I script it. And Sponge give us great templates as to what we need to do. But I write the scenarios. Probably do that around April or May. Get, it gets built, then we've got the translation process and the verification, and then we've got the testing at the end. So probably start in February, we roll out in September, we reconcile until December. I think I have two months a year where I'm not thinking about code. Thank you. <laughs> so what was it in the training itself? Because you said you did campaign on it. So that changed the uh, interest. But what was it on the training itself that was changed from before since it had so good feedback? Okay, so the elements. I think it was that we've tried quite a few different things, and, and, and I'm one that 
believes in continuous learning. The year before, we tried using analogies and metaphors, which personally I love, and we had some really amazing ones. And then we realized it didn't resonate at all in quite a few countries. So what we did instead was we talked about, I don't know if you're familiar with Simon Sinek and the why model. So we introduced the behaviors that we were talking to and the risks in terms of why it matters, how it shows up at AstraZeneca and what you can do about it. So throughout the course, I think we were empowering people, we were showing them why we care about something, but actually empowering them to be able to make a difference. And then interweaving, it, it's quite interesting. So we've still got the usual compliance-based risk scenarios, but for some reason when you do that and you put it in that context, they don't feel like that anymore. It, it somehow changes the feeling. Thank you. All right, we'll do one more before we move on to Sean. How did you make sure that the um, program was inclusive for people with maybe visual or hearing impairment? Um, we, we, we reached out to, to HR to see whether we, what we needed to provide. And my understanding is um, that there was a system that they could take a, a workbook version and then translate that to the hearing impaired if, if need be. Okay. Right, thank you, Louise. Um, thank you. We will have more time at the end for, for questions as well. And actually, just seconding what you said about the questions and when people are actually asking questions, I did see one diversity inclusion interactive video that a telecoms company had produced, and it had questions as you went through it, but there were no right answers at all. It didn't mark you. All it did is suggest what your answer might mean to the person in that video. And it was a really smart way of doing things. And didn't score, but because there was no right answer but it certainly made you think. So as there are different ways of, of doing questioning as you go. So what I'd like to do now, is, thank you again, Louise, um, is hand you over to Sean from Virgin Money, who's going to run through his scenario. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Thanks for coming along. I, I guess is the first thing, compliance. Uh, Quite a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today sort of uh, backs up sort of the number of people that are in this room because I'm assuming you haven't been forced to come along to this session, unlike what the majority happens uh, when you're in that sort of compliance or regulatory world. And working in the banking industry, there's a fair bit of compliance, a fair bit of regulation uh, that happens, so it's lovely to see you all. Uh, you know, choosing to come along to the session. Uh, so my name is Sean Brown. I am the colleague digital experience manager. That does not appear on any drop down for any application forms for anything anywhere. So I'm an HR manager to a lot of companies and insurance places. Uh, but colleague digital experience is really more focusing exactly on the journey. Uh, and it's a fairly new title, um, which I kind of came up with with my, with my manager a couple of years ago. Uh, and one of the first things that I really wanted to do was look at compliance, look at regulation, because it scared me, um, but it also excited me. Uh, and the reason it scared me was that generally, it's sort of looked upon as this is something I have to do, and the content can sometimes be very dry, uh, not great, it's a tick box. Um, and I wanted to try and change that perception. Um, and the way that I'd done that uh, on looking at a strategy that I put in place really gave me a bit of the fear um, because I was, I was scared that I was going to transfer that sort of negative connotation to regulatory compliance learning and put it into uh, a, a fantastic platform that we use that has just-in-moment, uh, just-in-time learning. Uh, the platform that we have is Your Learning Lounge. Uh, and it's specifically called that because the language around it is very important. I want people to feel that it is theirs, okay? Your Learning Lounge is our digital platform within Virgin Money where people go to access their, uh, well, now, their regulatory learning, but also a whole range um, of content that's digitally accessible to them uh, as well. And our provider is Good Practice. They provide us with the platform, but also for the majority of the content um, as well, which is why I come back to the fear, all right, because the content that in there, that's in there uh, is really good. 
And when I started looking at our compliance and regulatory learning, I was like, oh, I really don't want to put that in there um, at all. It was almost like taking Del Boy's um, van and parking it in like a Mercedes car park, uh, going, oh, that really looks out of place. So there was a lot of work that had to sort of go on. Um, so when it came to the strategy, obviously my title has got experience in it, so I needed the focus to be around that. But the immediate challenges I had, and I don't know if anyone else here is familiar with that as well, um, is that risk and legal really like people to go through this learning. Uh, and they really like people to go through it by, you know, click almost like death by PowerPoint or whatever slide is going to come up, which isn't a great experience. Um, so that was a, a pretty big challenge I had. Uh, the other challenge I had was that they really like to know that people are compliant. And why not? We're, we work in a bank. We need to make sure that people are you know, adhering to the rules, the regulations, all these sorts of things, which is great. And they were worried that on the change of strategy I was proposing, uh, that I was taking some of that away. Um, so it, it, it uh, created some really interesting conversations as I sort of kind of play them back in my mind uh, from some sort of questions. Uh, the other thing was that we have an LMS and I was taking the content for our regulatory and learning uh, and compliance modules out of our LMS and putting it into our digital channel. Uh, they do sit separately from each other. So you look at our LMS and it's very much, this is where I record my compliance and regulatory learning. This is where I do my SMCR for people who are familiar with the senior management certification regime to track all the CPD. It does all of that. Um, and that's essentially where our content sat as well for regulatory and compliance thing. And normally when you talk about that, you know, people start, you see their shoulders drop sort of straight away. And they might start going, I'll check out my phone and see what's happening on the land of Twitter or Facebook or something, because this is going to be really dull. Um, and, and again, it's that sort of perception which excited me to try and change. Can we have a positive experience by, uh, through our regulatory learning? What do you think the answer is to that? A resounding yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, um, let me show you how we sort of went through this then. So I'll talk about what the previous experience was like. And what we've got up here is that people accessing the content through a desktop, they would come into our LMS, they would then do the module, they would then do the test or assessment, and then that would be them complete. No deviation of that was allowed. Okay, so without any sort of choice, you had to do the module, you had to do the assessment. Okay, forced content out to people. The other thing was um, a lot of our regulatory learning was in house or homemade or, you know, uh, using articulate. And I apologize for anybody who works at articulate, I'm aware they've got a stall here. The tool is very good. But sometimes the people using the tool may not have the skill set to deliver a compelling e-learning solution. Okay, so it was a bit like me being reminded of a sorry, 15 year old guy with a girl. It's not you, it's me, you know? So it's not articulate, okay? Brilliant system, it's very good. It was us, all right? Um, so that was something I had to really think about as well is that I didn't want to pollute the really great content that we've got on our digital platform, on your learning lounge, with content that would just look so out of place. The other thing was, and as the rollout, every month there would be another regulatory module. We've actually got more than months which are there, uh, to be fair. I think we've got about 13 modules, 14 depending on which part of the, the business you work in. But yeah, every month there'd be another module coming out, there'd be another reminder coming out, there'd be multiple notifications that then come out for that as well. So it just constantly feels, again, I'm talking about experience here, it's not great. 
You know, you're getting regular content saying you have not done this, essentially. So that was our approach in 2017, which didn't feel right. For 2018, bring some color to the picture. And we've done a, a, what, what I've seen is a fairly simple change but quite a significant change in terms of the conversations that we had. So the simple change was this part here, the module. You don't need to do it anymore. It becomes optional. So that's quite a significant change because, you know, uh, our risk and legal uh, teams were going, let's just take a collective breath here, Sean. Why are you not getting people to go through the learning? And I was like, I kind of thought you were going to ask me that. So my response was pretty straightforward. We have never reported to you about how people are getting on when they go into the module. We only ever produce a report that tells you whether they are compliant or not, whether they've passed or whether they've failed. And I'm not changing that. You're still going to get exactly the same reports at exactly the same time that will tell you exactly the same information. So that helped, but the choice, this is why I come back to say thank you for choosing to come to compliance. Um, the choice here is that we now don't have to be restricted to a desktop. You can now come through a mobile channel, through an app. The fundamental choice though is that you can choose not to do the learning. This is regulatory learning that's normally done on an annual cycle. So people are quite familiar with data protection. People are quite familiar, you know, with health and safety or whatever it's going to be. So why should we constantly ask them to go through that learning every time that they need to go and do that test? It just doesn't feel right. Let's put them in control and let them make the choices around how they do regulatory learning. And I thought that's quite nice. You now have a choice. This is not something that's forced out. Every page you need to click to get through. And some people who have got a lot of knowledge will be furiously clicking like Dilly Thompson's Decathlon, 80s reference, um, you know, just trying to get to the end so they can do the test and inevitably pass it. So it was quite a step change for our organization. From a timing perspective as well, the sort of previous, um, the previous ways of doing it, you would be anywhere between 35 minutes to 45 minutes to, to take a module, okay? Because you'll have 20, 30 minutes to do the learning module, compulsory to do, and then you'll be anywhere between five, 10 minutes to do the test. Whereas now, we've got a bit of a range. You can actually complete your regulated learning within five minutes for that particular module if you just bypass learning and go in and do your test or your assessment. Um, or you can have that choice. You can dip in and do the learning. It's totally up to yourself. Coming back to the it's me, not you, um, I had to make sure that the content that was then on show was something that didn't look out of place when it's now sitting in your learning lounge, when it's sitting in our digital platform. So again, working with our partners um, at Good Practice, we connected them with the stakeholders in the business. Uh, so here's an example of the financial crime module. And again, it's, they just took that content and created something that's a far more engaging, looks far, far better um, as well, and works really seamlessly on um, any device that you're using. Great, big tick box. And again, it's in line with our Virgin brand um, as well, so it needs to look good. I mean, the Virgin brand, it's, it's a really interesting place to work, okay, because it's a double-edged sword at time. Because uh, you go, it's such a great brand, everything needs to be sort of red, uh, sexy, all these sort of things, and you go, hmm, yeah, compliance, regulatory, hmm. How can we get a virgin brand on there to give that level of expectation that people have about the brand? Uh, which is why it's great that we had to um, outsource that part because we just did not have the skill set. 
uh, within the organization to deliver that level of expertise. And as I say, it's available on any platform, on any device for people to choose to do or not. Okay, so the last thing we done was got rid of that monthly rollout. So this is a very simple slide because it's a very simple thing that we've done. We just launch quarterly now. So we say in, in Q1, there's these three modules for you to do. Crack on, do them whenever you want. As long as it's within that quarter. Uh, but you can do that whenever you want. So again, just given that control over to the business, because, you know, let's face it, there will be people out there that will go, I will wait until about there's two days to go at the end of a quarter, because that will motivate me to do my regulatory learning. And that's fine. At least they have that choice to do that. Um, or you'll get some people that will go, I'll, I'll get this done as quickly as I can. Fine. Again, they have the choice to do that. So, yeah, so we went to a quarterly rollout. So, with a focus then on our regulatory learning, here's an example of the type of content we ask people to do throughout the year. I'll explain these stats a little bit more. So here we've got the assessment. So this is what people have to do, okay? So there's still an element of compliance where we say you have to show that you're compliant. So these are all the hits that we have for those modules. And in 2017, this side would be exactly the same stats as that side because you've forced the learning, okay? Um, so now, in 2018, or sorry, last year now, um, with that choice, I started to get some really interesting information. Some information about how people interact with regulatory learning. And I've highlighted a couple of sections here. I'll come to the bottom section first, where we see some significant drop, you know, inside information, conduct rules. These are modules, even competition law, modules that the business are familiar on doing on a regular basis every year. You need to do this. Uh, so at what point do we think that they're going to completely forget all that information? Some of it's pertinent for, their, uh, for the job that they do. So they actually know their stuff. This is, what, this is what's telling me that they know, their, they, they know their stuff. What further backs that up is GDP, GDPR was launched last year. Brand new module, brand new content. Through choice, it's been accessed more times than the assessment was done. So that's not us forcing the content out. What that's telling me is that people will go and use the learning if they need to. Likewise with financial crime, another new module which came out um, for us last year. And again, the stats show that when people have a choice, they will actively access the learning which they feel is relevant for them. So I would never have got this sort of insight before from forcing the learning. This starts to tell me a lot of um, insight from the people who interact on our systems that the option of choice, um, they'll choose not to do that. We're still compliant. Uh, but when people do need to learn, they still choose to learn, sometimes over and above. This 92% is the uh, pass rate of our exams. So 20. 2017, you had three attempts, and then it would lock it, lock down. This was just never made any sense to me. So if you failed the attempt three times, what's the consequence? You're going to have to phone HR, i.e. me, uh, and get me to reset your attempts for you. That's the consequence. I'm like, what are we doing? We're creating work, i.e. for me, that I don't really want to do and additional work for people who probably don't want to do the learning, you know, the, the test or make this phone call to say, oh, I've uh, failed it uh, three times. Can you reset it for me, please? Um, I've not seen any drop in our stats. Now that people are in control and I've removed that three, three hits or you need to get reset by HR rule, I've kicked that into touch. There was no regulatory requirement for us to have a three rule um, you know, one in there. 
So again, I was like, let's just strip out the stuff that we don't need. Let's not create additional work or additional pain for people. Let's make sure that experience just feels right. So 92%, we're still doing really well in terms of our competency levels. But what's also interesting is that, so back on that previous slide, because not everybody is accessing the content now, you can actually go back to the business and give them a little gift, a fairly significant gift of 813 working days. That's what you would have wasted in 2017. Um, and if we're all about efficiencies, which I'm sure everybody feels that efficiencies needs, needs to be met while still being compliant, it's a great gift to give back. How are you going to reinvest the, those 813 working days back into the business? So we, it's not just about this information, it's not just about ticking a box and saying we are compliant. This is about listening to what the pain points are for people when they look at regulatory learning, what the stakeholders' fears or perceived fears are about that regulatory learning and how the overall experience um, can change with just doing some really simple things. So it's a great thing to hand back to the organization as well. Some further evidence of impact here. This is where some of the impact was quite surprising for me. So we've got 91% access your learning lounge on a regular basis within the organization. Brilliant stats, really, really good. And some of the cynics here might say, yeah, but Sean, you've put your regulatory learning into your digital channel, so of course your stats are gonna be pretty good. And I'm like, okay, that's fair enough, yeah. That, that might, may well be the case, why we've got such high utilization, but let's not forget the fact that people have the choice. I'm not forcing them to come into this channel it's their choice to come into this channel to access the learning. So 91%, really good. We've got 51,840 individual resources viewed. So, from, so that's not just regulatory learning, okay? A big chunk of that is regulatory learning, um, specifically 34,851, if anyone loves stats. That's how much was regulatory learning. So that leaves us with 16,989 non-regulatory learning. So from that non-regulatory learning, because we had the toolkit last in 2017, it's actually with giving people the choice to go into your learning lounge to access your regulatory learning and non-regulatory learning, I've actually found an 85% increase on people now accessing non-regulatory learning. So the toolkit itself, whilst, we're, whilst there is, and we're not driving traffic to it, we're giving people the option, what we're finding is it's having a positive impact on our specific digital channel of just-in-time learning. They're looking at other things, which is brilliant. Um, the three million pound potential in bold here. Okay, um, so when we come back when I went back to that slide that says, we're giving all these days back to the business, I specifically spoke to the head of sales within our store and lounge networks. Uh, and I said, what would you do with the time that we'd actually given back to you now uh, in the business? And naturally, uh, the discussion was around more time with customers, more interviews, more business, more sales. Ultimately, that's what we're, we're here to do. So we found an algorithm on how much time uh, that we can give back to our stores network, or sales network. Can we put a pound sign on that? And we can. Um, the figure is actually way beyond three million, but I genuinely feel like I'm a news of the world sensationalist if I put up what the actual figure is. I've just taken 10% of what the potential sales revenue would be if you reinvested the time that you've saved back into dedicating that with your customers, then this is what we could potentially open up. But I've just taken a 10% slice, because I think there's a, you know, there, there has to be reality at some point. You're not going to convert all of that time saved into sales, all right? So 10%, I think, is pretty decent. 
uh, to average a potential revenue handed back into our network. Overall, with our digital learning channel, uh, just over 1,500 days of learning has been viewed to date. So again, it complements our face-to-face -face learning or coaching mentoring that all happens within the organization anyway. Uh, and our average time is about four minutes that people spend uh, within that dedicated digital channel. So yeah, so I think when it comes back to, you know, should we have done it? Should we not have done it? I think we've definitely taken the right chance. It was a risk though to make that choice on taking our regulatory content out of our LMS and into our digital channel. Because I was really scared that there would be that sort of negative impact uh, that people would think, oh, you know, now that regulatory sits within your learning lounge, I'm not going to go there. Uh, but the stats completely smashed that out of the park. That's not the case at all. So we've increased the relationships um, within the organization for their non-regulatory learning by changing the attitude and approach to our regulatory learning, which is a, which is a brilliant out, output. So what's next? So things which I will be looking at. I will be looking at our assessments. Now that I know that I've got this information about how people are interacting, choosing not to do learning, what can I do with the learning that might make the assessment slightly different? Um, so now it's about trying to dig in a little bit further. Can we get more specific assessments for people who are already knowledgeable? Either save more time or just, um, again, make sure that we're still being compliant, but in a non sort of here's 10 questions, find the right eight answers sort of way. Accessibility is not just about mobile. Um, apologies. Uh, accessibility is also about um, people who require um, the information to be converted into whatever works for them from an accessible point of view uh, as, as well. What's interesting from a mobile perspective, though, is that people really ask for mobile learning, and they've had it for the last year, year and a half, and hardly anybody uses it. Yeah, everybody asks for it. You know, they're like, oh, if you're going to have a digital channel, Sean, I want it on an app. I want it on my phone, not just my work phone, my personal phone. Yeah, sure, no problems, I can do that for you. And when I look at my stats, I go, really? Is, I think people are just being nice to me to say that, you know, this is what they want, but they're not really using it. So there'll be a bit of a campaign, a bit more of a focus around accessibility, specifically for mobile. And from a, an analytical point of view, so now that I'm getting richer information from the MI through our regulatory learning, it starts to build learning profiles for different parts of the organization. So I can see that IT learn in a particular way, HR are different, customer services, again, are different. So it just that information, now that we've sort of split it out and get a greater um, depth and connection with people, it starts to change what sort of the learning profiles, and I don't mean this by, you know, uh, learning profiles, I prefer to read or I prefer to go to a workshop. Um, it's more about what does a typical uh, learning profile look for our marketing department. So just now my stats are telling me they really like infographics, shock horror, something that's visual. Um, but ultimately we can take that information and if they come to our L&D department and say, we're looking for a solution, we can already be on the front foot. We can already say to them, okay, we see that you really like infographics, so how about we just commission some work and do an infographic, rather than maybe going to a default piece of e-learning, click through, or a workshop. Uh, so again, we can just be a bit more proactive with this information, with the business, and again, strengthen those relationships um, as well. So that's the next part of what we'll be continuing on our compliance, regulation, digital learning type journey. And that's me. I'll hand you back over to, to Matt. Thank you very much. Uh, right, we do have uh, some time for a, a few questions. Um, but also, I'd like if, if a few of you can think about some of the actions that you want to take away and that you are actually going to commit to taking away as well from what you've heard, that'd be great. So do we have any, any questions for, for Sean? I'll come straight down the middle there. Let's get questions from each side of the room for you, Matt. Um, I'm grappling with compliance training for uh, junior and senior researchers at the moment. So um, I found your talk really interesting and really relevant to what I'm trying to work through. Um, I have two 
questions. One, was everybody allowed to skip straight to the test? So yeah. even if you're a new employer, a new employee or a junior yeah. role? Yep. Um, and secondly, how have you handled updates? So if, let's say, there's a, a change in a regulation that relates to a specific module, have you updated the test and let people kind of skip to that again? Or have you tried to take them through the learning? So I think that's where we can get better with the assessments, um, because ultimately we need to change the learning itself if there is a change in regulation. That needs to be updated, so the learning gets changed and the assessment likewise gets changed for that. Um, the assessment is certainly within our control, because that's something that we push out on our LMS. Uh, for the learning, which is, uh, is, is designed externally, then again we just talk to our partners about making the appropriate changes for that. But the first part of your question, it doesn't matter whether you're, if it's day one or, or day a thousand, uh, you can skip straight to the test if you want to. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Oh, yes. Yeah, you weren't joking about being on all sides of the room. Yeah. Actively encourage it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Get your step count up. Um, hi, yes. Um, you said the modules are optional and people can skip straight to the assessments. Um, and I can understand the logic there, but I suppose the cynical part of me wants to ask, how do you ensure that people are actually learning the module, the content, and not just learning how to pass a test? Yeah, well, I guess when you look at the test itself, it's going to particularly reference content from the module. Um, so the test isn't just sort of the same questions that we would have year in, year out. Um, that gives us our level of assurance that, I mean, we're asking them questions about regulation or whatever law or um, what our specific procedures would be on recognizing whistleblowing or you know, whatever it's going to be. Um, so if they can demonstrate by not going into the learning that they've done that, then... So the assessment changes every year, does it? It's not if, if a static it, sort of you know, multiple choice. So somebody who's done it once can come in next year and they're going to know the layout and they can just... Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really good point because we have a bank of questions. So it's, you know, out of that 10, there will be, there'll be a bank of 30. Uh, so even if you fail the test, then you're going to get another set of questions coming up which are completely different. Uh, and again, that would just be reviewed. If there's any changes within regulation or whatever that's going to be, then they will get updated. That's owned by the business, though, not by us. Uh, it's their responsibility. Again, going back to lots of talks that we've heard already throughout the day, I hear that all the, all the knowledge is in the business, so exactly why we keep the stakeholders in charge of the assessment questions and the learning in itself. Okay, thank you. Oh, right, we're coming with that side now. I'm loving this. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I can really understand the idea of skipping the test and so on, and I guess it makes sense for, for procedures and operational things, but what about the culture? I mean, if you skip the whole learning part, so you can't like learn people having like compliance mindset, just asking them question because they can new procedure, but not necessarily they have like compliance mindset, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. So from a cultural perspective though, it's more about recognizing people have choice um, on things that they do. So they, you know, and that isn't just about whether you're doing your regulatory learning or not, that's whatever you're doing within your role. Um, you know, you can choose one career path or another career path, you can choose, so you've got choice already out there within the organisation, that's what our culture is like. And so it's important that we reflect what our culture is when it comes to our regulatory learning. The bottom line though is, is that we need to have people who are compliant, okay? That is the absolute bottom line and we need to demonstrate that uh, people are adhering to, you know, the regulations which are out there. So that is purely done by the test in itself on whether people are passing or, or failing that uh, test in itself. The learning part has never taken any interest from the business. And what I mean here is they've never been interested about how or what people are learning as part of that regulatory part. They just want to know whether people are competent or not in that particular field. Um, so I just sort of bypass that section and just really just give, give people that choice to do the learning or not. I can still report on it, but now far more accurately around who is genuinely wanting to access the learning for themselves. 
Uh, and, and I guess the only other thing that, that's an additional benefit to the business is that because I've taken it out of the LMS and it now sits on that digital platform, it's available 24-7. Uh, whereas before you would do it in the LMS and then it would disappear once you've completed your module. It's been done, completed, it's off your plan. Never to be seen again until we then force it back out to you. Uh, whereas at least this time, if people are moving roles and it's moving into a more regulated role, the learning is always available for them. Um, and yeah, if they then need to do the assessment, then fine, we can just ping the assessment out to them. Um, so I think that choice is really important because it, it, it was going against our culture um, of forcing things down uh, for people, and that's not what we're really all about. Yeah, I mean, one of the other modules that we've got isn't really a regulatory push-out, but it's, build, it's called Building a Better Bank. Uh, and within that, there's a lot more things in there about ethics, a lot more about, you know, the importance of the foundations of a bank, which are your regulatory and your compliance. Again, ultimately, people can choose to look at that learning or not. There is an assessment at the end of that as well. Um, but I guess we're providing a platform here for people to be assessed. Um, within that, there's also an element of what their responsibilities are of their manager, of the, what it's like in the area that they're working in as well in terms of the importance around compliance. Uh, and I think that far more uh, profile around compliance should sit day to day within the organisation and shouldn't really be measured in a sense on a yearly rollout of a module because all you're really going to get there is understanding of you know, the regulations or whatever it is, but the cultural side um, should be promoted more from within the, org within the business that those people work in. Okay, thank you. Um, we are pretty much at time. Is there anyone who's got one short question or one point they would like to make that they can take away? We'll do one quick question. Cheers. I'm hoping it's actually going to be a bit of a, a fun one for you to answer at the end. So, um, given, I think, from your presentation, I really take away, Sean, that you are... Um, you, you're quite happy in challenging some of the status quo and some of the, the policies and procedures that have kind of come before. If you could kind of gloves off do one thing with compliance using technology that we see in other aspects of learning, you know, not necessarily uh, compliance, you know, so machine learning, VR, AR, is there something that's kind of, uh, you know, at the front of your mind that you want to achieve in the next couple of years in relation to compliance learning? Um. Great question, and I think the, the thing that I would like is that the, I, I see learning more and more these days as not uh, curators anymore of content, and that real curation of content, the real daily uh, life of what happens within work sits within work. I think it would be great if there was a piece of tech out there that could capture that essence of what really matters for people from a compliance or regulatory side or whatever it's going to be, and then can start to generate some form of, uh, the word assessment's probably wrong here, but something where it can be curated from within the business which feels right for people in the finance team, that they've got questions which feel really relevant to what they do on their day-to-day -day basis. Because just now our assessments are quite broad and it's like, this is what our regulatory compliance is for preventing money laundering. Do you know what form needs to be filled in? But really, preventing money laundering will be more prevalent within certain parts of the business than other parts of the business. And I would like that um, uniqueness of assessment around that knowledge recognized within the business for them to be able to do that. Um, and then we can just provide the platform or the environment for that to actually happen. So I think that's probably what I would like gloves off to do. I can feel the sweat from risk and compliance and legal already uh, falling from their heads around how do you know it's going to be this, that and the other. But, you know, the knowledge is in the business. It's trust, it's honesty. Um, and you'll find that there's a huge amount of information you can gather from the business if you just talk, listen and don't force it. Okay, well, thank you, everyone, and uh, I think I'd like to thank Louise and Sean for the, for the session.